Hello everybody, I thought I'd go back to evolution and genetics and analyse this video from Paul Williams of Blogging Theology and Joshua Swamidas. Let's hear his credentials. For those who don't know, um, Joshua is an associate professor in the Laboratory and Genomic Medicine Division at Washington University in St. Louis in the United States. Uh, his research uh, focuses upon using computational methods uh, to solve problems at the intersection of medicine, chemistry, and biology. Um, he's the author of a recent highly acclaimed book entitled The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. And this will be the, the central subject of, of our discussion today. Now, Joshua is a committed Christian, and as a student, uh, he struggled to reconcile what he was told the Bible said with what he was learning about the origins of the world. This is going to be the central theme of this discussion, where Joshua Swamadas tries to explain how the Adam and Eve story could be accommodated within our modern scientific knowledge about human origin. The genealogical account does not prove Adam and Eve's existence, but it's impossible to disprove the existence of such a couple 6,000 years ago. The summary of his argument is that there's no evidence for Adam and Eve in science, but that we can't disprove it. Let's hear more. Because you can affirm all of evolutionary science, he writes, and that doesn't actually conflict with a literal reading of Genesis. Swamada starts off by saying how his book has similarities to the book called Islam and Evolution, written by Shoab Malik. This seems an attempt at building bridges between different faiths. The idea of like animal evolution was never that troubling to me. Maybe it wasn't always believable, but it was never really a trouble. The real big challenge was this idea of like us kind of deriving from a common ascent with the great apes. Mm -hmm. And these seem like totally two different questions. Humans are animals, so if you can readily accept animal evolution, then you should readily accept human evolution from other animals. He outlines the Adam and Eve story with the theory of evolution and claims that they are not incompatible. The question mark here on this slide is where the two of them talk about what is outside of the Garden of Eden. What I'm saying is, like, let's take that question mark and just suppose that maybe if evolution is true, that what's happening is that science is just kind of filling in and telling us the answer to this mystery. It's telling us that, well, what had happened is that God had created people outside the garden. Mm. And then those people interbred with Adam and Eve's descendants uh, when they fell. And uh, so we descend both from Adam and Eve and these people outside the garden. So his solution is to postulate that humans evolved in a way that we understand now from scientific evidence, but that there was still a special creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and that after the fall, or whatever you want to call it, Adam and Eve interbred with people, and that we are all their descendants. Let's see if there's any evidence for this. Now, most of the discussion has been, I mean, I talked about ancestor, and one of the big questions that really has to come to the table, though, to really make sense of this, is whether or not we mean genealogical ancestors or genetic. He introduces the concept of genetic versus genealogical ancestors. To help explain this, look at this simple family tree. We each get half of our DNA from our father and half from our mother. We have four grandparents, so we get approximately a quarter of our DNA from each grandparent. We get an eighth of our DNA on average from each great grandparent. The further back in time we go, the greater the number of ancestors we have, who in turn provide a smaller percentage of our DNA. Apart from our parents, the amount of DNA we get from each ancestor is only an approximate. It's quite possible that we get at some stage zero DNA from one ancestor. This is what he means when he says that this ancestor is a geological ancestor and not a genetic ancestor. And this is a diagram that really kind of has been helpful for kind of explaining that. So you can imagine yourself right there in the center as a circle, and you have 100% of your DNA. That's why kind of according to this legend here, um, it's black, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have two parents above you, a mother and a father, 
And there, you get about 50% of your DNA from each one of them. And so that's why it's about 50% gray there. You got that? Right. Yeah, I'm with you. And then um, there's your grandparents, and there's four of them, and you get about 25% of your DNA. And then, um, then your great-grandparents, there's eight of them, and you'll notice that it's not exactly the same uniform color. That's because you inherit your DNA in chunks, and there's it's not exactly. So there's a little bit of variation, all right? And you keep on going back, and then um, you know it's doubling the number of ancestors you have as you go back um, mm -hmm. in this range, right? Mm -hmm. By about uh, about six generations back, about five generations generations back, that's maybe about 150 years or so. We start to see these dark green ones pop up. Now those are ones that I labeled here down here that actually give you zero percent DNA, and they're genetic ghosts. So they're actually your ancestors, but you didn't get any DNA from them. So the other thing we can look at is how quickly does this take? It turns out that gen genetic ancestors are pretty ancient. So if you're thinking about mitochondrial Eve or Y chromosome Adam, which have nothing to do with Adam and Eve, they're going to be over 100,000 years ago in the past. He's correct that they don't have anything to do with the theological Adam and Eve. Mitochondrial Eve is the most recent woman from whom all living humans descend in an unbroken line, purely through the maternal line, until all lines converge on one woman. She lived about 155,000 years ago. Y chromosome Adam is the individual from whom all living humans are descended along the paternal line. He is the most recent male from whom all living humans are descended through an unbroken line of their male ancestors. He lived 200 to 300,000 years ago. This diagram here demonstrates mitochondrial Eve. All the women alive who are shown on the bottom of the diagram can trace their line up to the woman in black at the top of the diagram. She is mitochondrial Eve. A similar diagram for men would show Y chromosome Adam at the top of the diagram. What we're saying is as important as the genealogical common ancestors. Mm -hmm. And they rise really, really recently, and they rise, rise all over the place. So, you know, our best estimates from science, and I worked this out in detail, and just about everyone, almost everyone across the globe at 6,000 years ago, is really an ancestor of everyone. <laughs> 6,000 years seems he's trying too hard to fit in with the biblical narrative. Modern estimates put the age of the most recent common ancestor of all living humans to be about 2,000 years ago probably living in East Asia, not the Middle East. So you're, you're saying all of the uh, people alive today, the human race, are actually can trace their ancestors, this is genealogy of course, back to two people 6,000 years ago? Are we saying? Are yeah, we saying two people, but there would have, they would have been interbreeding with others, right? So really, there's a large population, there's around 50 million people across the globe 6,000 uh, 6, years ago, okay? It's pretty clear. I mean, now there might be some debate about whether it should be really 6,000 or 8,000 years ago. Even young Earth creationists are usually pretty comfortable having Adam and Eve as ancient as like 8,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. That's all pretty recent, right? This seems to coincide with the advent of what we would call civilization, recorded history, I suppose, in a sense. You know, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's something important there. Um, I think that Adam and Eve are not so much about the origin of biological homo sapiens, but they might have a lot to do with the origin of civilizations and nations across the globe. This slide just repeats his point that Adam and Eve are our genealogical ancestors who did not leave us any DNA. You can see Adam and Eve's DNA being gradually diluted over time to the point where we are now at the bottom of the diagram. Okay, at what point, what point, uh, I get the graph, I get the graph, but at what point then do we see the last genetic descendant of Adam and Eve? Not the genealogical, because obviously we're all ge geological, genealogical descendants of Adam and Eve, you say, the whole human races. But when was the last, I mean, is this like 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, do you think? Well, it's hard to say um, mm. because there's, it's going to depend on a lot of details that we don't have. And, yeah. um, and you know, maybe you know, Adam and Eve were the lottery winners, right? It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a lottery. Like there are people who are going to give us DNA from the past, but they, they're kind of like a lottery, lottery winners. They're not actually, um, they're not common. So we obviously got our DNA from some people in the past, 
Yeah. Maybe we got some DNA from Adam and Eve, but most likely not. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got it from other people. So most of our DNA, for sure, comes from people outside the garden. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a chance, but there's really no way to identify which of that DNA was theirs or not. The rest of this discussion goes off into other theology. In this video with Gutsit Gibbon, he tries to integrate his ideas with modern science. This slide shows how none of the proposed mechanisms work or have empirical evidence. I will link this video in the description. In summary, Dr. Swamadas has looked at the overwhelming evidence for human evolution and has tried to see where he could fit in his religious beliefs about Adam and Eve in a way that would satisfy a religious believer while not appearing to be outlandishly anti-science. But why should anyone consider Adam and Eve why not all the other untestable creation stories? What about the idea that there were flying unicorns and that about six to eight million years ago a unicorn farted on a population of apes in East Africa, which caused a subpopulation of them to evolve into humans? There is no evidence for this, like with Dr. Swamadas's idea. But also, like Dr. Swamadas's idea, you can't prove that this did not happen. In this response from Dr. Jerry Coyne, which I will link in the description, he makes it clear that, contrary to what Dr. Swamadas says, science is not silent on a de novo creation of Adam and Eve, as it's not scientific for humans to just suddenly appear. If we have to consider his idea because it can't be disproven, then you have to also consider a whole host of superstitious entities from multiple creation stories across the world because they are equally impossible to disprove. The best summary for Dr. Swamadis' idea is Hitchens' razor. What can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence.